At the moment, Gormley asked MacArthur if he could send Guadalcanal some lightning fighters. MacArthur replied with truth and reason that he needed his handful of lightnings for defence of New Guinea and Australia. Could Gormley possibly lend him one or two of his four carriers? No, said Gormley. He needed them to keep the sea lanes to Guadalcanal open. Besides, there were now only three. Stately old Sarah Maru, as her crew called Saratoga, was steaming on defensive patrol about 260 miles southeast of Guadalcanal. There had been a submarine scare, but now, at about seven in the morning, the sea sparkled serenely in the sun, and a bugle called all hands to breakfast. Chow lines formed while Sarah Maru's screen moved dutifully around the big ship. Outside the screen, off Sarah's bow, all this was observed with rising excitement by a Japanese officer watching through submarine I-26's periscope. At about a quarter of eight, six long lance torpedoes went hissing from the submarine's tubes. A minute later, destroyer McDonough sighted the periscope about 30 feet off her bow. She hoisted the torpedo warning and moved in. She dropped two depth charges which had no depth setting and were therefore useless, and then simultaneously her hull scraped against the diving submarine's side and a torpedo porpoised astern. On Saratoga, Captain DeWitt, Ramsey swung his rudder hard right and rang up full speed. Slowly, ponderously, old Sara Maru turned toward the torpedo wakes, but not enough. Two minutes later, a torpedo smashed her starboard side abreast of the island superstructure. It did not seem too bad. No one was killed and only twelve men, including Admiral Fletcher, had been slightly wounded. But after Saratoga finally made it with a tow back to Tongatabu, it was discovered that it would require three months to repair her. Saratoga was out of the fight for Guadalcanal. Next day, Vandergrift learned of her loss with a sinking heart, for he had also heard of General Kawaguchi's landing to the east the night before. Crisis was recurring, and he ordered the raiders and paratroopers to move from Tulagi to Guadalcanal, an hour after dark. On the night of September 3rd, a message arrived at Cactus Operations. A transport was arriving, and the airfield would have to be illuminated. Seven jeeps bounced to the south end of the strip and switched on their lights. There was a thundering overhead, and some of the drivers instinctively ducked. The transport's wheels cleared them by a few feet, and the big plane bumped to a halt. The door swung open and a cold white grizzly bear in khaki stepped down. Brigadier General Roy Geiger had flown up from the New Hebrides, where he was supposed to be commanding the 1st Marine Air Wing to take charge of Cactus Air Force. With him were his Chief of Staff, Colonel Lewis Woods, and his Intelligence Officer, Lieutenant Colonel John Munn. They were three of the most experienced air officers in the Marine Corps, led by a general who won his wings in 1916 and had flown every type of aircraft from the open cockpit crates of World War I to the newest model Grumman fighters then parked in Henderson's Coconuts. Roy Geiger was also a Paris Island classmate of Archer Vandergrift, and he had helped him fight Kakos in Haiti by or daring his pilots to load a small bomb aboard a Jenny and drop it on an enemy stronghold simultaneously with a ground attack launched by Vandergrift. The day after Geiger arrived, pitching his tent not far from the pagoda, he called on his old friend. He brought him a package from Admiral Nimitz marked fan mail. Vandergrift opened it. It was a case of scotch, but Geiger was aware that Vandergrift, a Virginian, subscribed to the Virginian's belief that a man who drank scotch rather than bourbon was either a tourist or a show-off, and so he said, Archer, I have a case of bourbon, and I'll trade you level, even though mine are quartz. Vandergrift was delighted, and the two generals placed the scotch, as rare as bathing beauties on Guadalcanal, into a jeep and drove off to Geiger's tent. Geiger looked for his bourbon and found that it was gone. Some pink-cheeked flyboy with more red balls on his fuselage than hairs on his chin had made off with his general's refreshments, and the general's face beneath his thatch of snow-white hair was also round and red, and his bleak blue eyes were icy with rage. Archer Vandergrift, Virginian though he was, decided that he was not now in Virginia. He would keep the scotch. He gave his old friend two bottles and departed, and Geiger took command of Cactus Air Force in a humour so foul that even Colonel Woods, accustomed to his chief's harsh, cold furies, was impressed. In such mood, Geiger drove his flyers from a splendid August into a superb September.
Henderson's old-timers and the new arrivals of Colonel Wallace had already learned to fight together, having knocked down seven of forty enemy attackers on September 2nd, two of them falling to Major Gaylor's guns. And the following day, Leo Smith's dive-bombers joined Mangrums to fall upon Colonel Oka and his thousand Kawaguchis barging down the slot. On Geiger's first day of command, Wildcats were sent to help the Dauntlesses make Oka's passage even more harrowing than Admiral Tanaka had predicted, and on the ensuing two days, scout bombers went ranging 200 miles to the northwest to strike at Gizo Bay, the heretofore too distant daylight hideout of the Tokyo Express. Gradually, Geiger's inordinately bad temper subsided into his normal curtness. He became fond of his young flyers, jaunty in their dark blue baseball caps and shoulder holsters. In turn, they ceased to think of him as ruthless, but as single-mindedly aggressive, and they called him the old man, a magnificent band of fighters had found the right leader, and it was well, for the Tokyo Express was recruiting cruisers and destroyers by the dozen, and Rabaul and Buka were reinforced with aircraft to the extent that Geiger would be outnumbered 180 planes to 70 by mid-September. Nevertheless, the men of Cactus Air Force continued to whittle the enemy, growing in offensive spirit and gathering almost nightly at the Hotel de Gink, Henderson's hostelry for visiting pilots, to toast each other in medicinal alcohol, or perhaps borrowed one-star bourbon. Meanwhile, as the Solomon's aerial war grew fiercer, the Seabees began working on Henderson Field. The 6th Naval Construction Battalion arrived at Guadalcanal on September 1st. Like all other Seabees, these men were experienced craftsmen. They were tractor drivers, carpenters, masons, dynamiters, electricians, ship fitters, machinists and so on, who had volunteered to put their skills at their country's disposal. Most of them were well past the draft age. Some of them were veterans of World War I. Their average age of 35 was nearly double the age of many of van der Grift's marines, who watched the Seabees coming ashore and thought that they were being reinforced by their fathers. What the hell, Pop? They running out of men at home? Hey, Pop, you get your wars mixed up or something. Hang on to your false teeth, Grandad. The Japs are dropping sandwiches. The Seabees grinned weakly, until one of the Marines inevitably went too far, chortling. Seabees, huh? Stands for confused rascals, you ask me. What in hell you old geezers gonna do here? I'll tell you what, you mother's mistakes, a Seabee roared back. We're gonna protect the Marines. It was not exactly true, but it had the effect of provoking sweet shouts of anguish from the indignant Marines. Thereafter, and throughout the Pacific War, both Seabees and Marines were drawn together in a rough but affectionate camaraderie based upon mutual respect. Having been rushed to Guadalcanal, the 6th Battalion's men had very little equipment. Two bulldozers, six dump trucks and a big waddling carriole capable of scooping up 12 cubic yards of earth. But they also had Japanese trucks and tractors, graders and rollers, Japanese cement and Japanese poles, lumber and soil pipe. With this, and with gradually increasing supplies of their own, they took over the job of completing and enlarging Henderson Field, while also repairing the strip after enemy air raids. Repair was vital, and it had to be done quickly. The moment the Japanese approach was signalled, all of Henderson's wildcats roared aloft to intercept, while the Dauntlesses and P-400S clunkers, as they were now called, took off either to fly out of range or to bomb and strafe the Japanese at either end of the island but every plane which survived the raid would be coming back, returning to a field pocked with craters. One afternoon in early September, the Seabees watched in agony while seven fighters came in one after another and cracked up. So the Seabees discovered that the enemy's 500-pound bomb usually tore up 1,600 square feet of Marston steel matting, and packages of that much matting were placed alongside the strip. Trucks loaded with exactly the amount of sand and gravel required to fill such a crater were parked out of sight at strategic points. Compressors and pneumatic hammers to pack the fill were placed in readiness. Assembly lines for passing and laying matting were organised. At the moment of the enemy's approach, all of the CB's cooks included raced to their stations. The moment the bombers departed, sometimes while Zeros shrieked down to strafe, they made for the airstrip. Twisted matting was torn from the craters, even as the loaded trucks roared up from the coconut groves. Fill was poured into the holes while men with hammers and compressors lapped in to pack it. New matting was passed, laid, 
and linked to undamaged strips. Inside 40 minutes, the hole would be completely filled and covered. Repairing shell holes, of course, took longer. The Seabees had to wait before going to work, for as everyone on Guadalcanal knew, if the bombers left as quickly as they came, it seemed that the Tokyo Express would never leave. It was next to impossible for Cactus Air Force to derail the Tokyo Express at night. The Japanese ships were only visible during periods of bright moonlight, and these, of course, were the nights when they usually stayed home. Moreover, weather conditions worsened during September, and the moon was on the wane, and the wily Tanaka had instructed his skippers never to reveal position by firing on American aircraft at night. They only fired when they were ready to depart, sailing westward through the bay, blasting Henderson and the marine positions as they went, and hitting top speed as they cleared Savo and turned northwestward for home. Nevertheless, Henderson's pilots always took to the skies whenever the Tokyo Express was reported landing troops or supplies. They tried to illuminate the bay with flares, and sometimes they went down as low as 500 feet, looking for long, dark shapes. But they seldom did more than keep the Japanese on the alert. Warships equipped with radar might sink the enemy ships, but the American Navy had not been back in force since Savo. Nor were American sailors the equal of Japanese seamen in night fighting. They were still cautious, fearful of firing on friendly ships, and they were not trained to recognise the enemy by silhouette as the Japanese were. Blue, the destroyer that had been blind to Admiral Mikawa's approach at Savo, gave tragic demonstration of these failings the night after the Battle of the Tenaru. With another destroyer, Henley, she tried to intercept a Japanese landing. Four minutes after her sonar and radar had made a contact on a strange ship, and just as she was bringing her guns and torpedo tubes to bear, she was racked by a long lance from the enemy destroyer Kawakazi, which had just put troops ashore. Blue lost several feet of her stern and had to be scuttled. After this, although perhaps not on account of this, there were fewer and fewer American warships entering Iron Bottom Bay at night. Little and Gregory were two of a rare kind at Guadalcanal, ships that stayed. Sisters of Sunken Colhoun, they were old four-stack destroyers converted into fast transports. They had brought Red Mike Edson and the raiders and parachutists from Tulagi to Guadalcanal, and on September 4th they took aboard a party of raiders under Colonel Griffith to patrol Savo Island. Aboard Little a lookout cried, Periscope! and the ship prepared to close with depth charges before the periscope was sheepishly recognised as the mast of a sunken American ship. Ashore on Savo, the raiders found no Japanese but only charred and oily debris and the mounds of shallow graves, still more grim testimonials to the efficiency of Admiral Mikawa's ships. A native named Ale Luva told the patrol that the Japanese had not been on Savo since July. Take bananas, chicken, pumpkin, everything, Alan Luver said angrily. Him talk pigeon? Someone asked. Like drunk man. Alan Luver snorted. Him talk aeroplane and Guadalcanar. The Marines laughed and went back aboard Gregory and Little. They returned to Guadalcanal at dusk. Because it was an extremely dark night, Little and Gregory did not go back to Tulagi Harbour as was customary. Commander Hugh Hadley in Little decided to patrol off Lunga Point. At one o'clock next morning, the Americans observed gunfire flashes in the east near Taivu. Destroyers Yudachi, Hatsuyuki and Murakumo were to provide diversionary bombardment while transports put the last of General Kawaguchi's men ashore at Taivu. At about one o'clock in the morning, they began, and then the startled gunners looked to the west, where two small American destroyer transports were beautifully outlined in the light of five beautiful American flares. Little and Gregory both thought the gun flashes were from a Japanese submarine. They sped eastward, and then a Catalina on patrol a half mile ahead also saw the flashes, and also thought that they came from a submarine, and helpfully dropped a string of flares to mark the target. In that light, the three enemy destroyers, each nearly as big as a light cruiser, began battering Americans mounting only one four-incher, some 20 millimeter guns, and a few light and heavy machine guns. Little and Gregory fought bravely, but within a few salvos of feelers, the Japanese had the range. Commander Hadley was killed on Little's bridge. Gregory was shredded by salvos of five-inch shells and set blazing from stem to stern. Both ships were blazing wrecks, but the Japanese made certain of their destruction. They sailed between them, 
hurling shells to both sides. Many Americans in the water were killed by those shells. Some of them dove deep to get beneath burning oil, to avoid flaming embers cascading down from their ships. They tried to swim out of seas of fire, and sometimes, if they were lucky, water which had risen into the sky in long geysering plumes came raining down to put out the fires around them. Others, such as Lieutenant Commander Harry Bauer, skipper of Gregory, were not so fortunate. Badly wounded, Bauer struggled to escape both burning oil and the suction of his sinking ship. Two men, Clarence Justice and Chester Ellis, swam to his side to pull him free. Bauer heard a sailor cry out that he was drowning. He directed his rescuers to the man's aid, and he was never seen again. Once more, tragedy had overtaken American ships and men on the dark brooding surface of Iron Bottom Bay, and far to the west, Lieutenant Richard Amarine heard the thundering and saw the flashing, and he wondered what was happening now on this satanic paradise. The Japanese had not seen Amarine parachute into the jungle around Cape Esperance. No one had come for him, but Amarine was growing weak. He had been subsisting for five days on snails and insects. He knew which ones were edible because he was an entomologist. In fact, he had seen such an astounding variety of insects that he had been broken-hearted not to have a butterfly net with him. That day, though, he would have traded it for a rifle. He had nearly blundered into a party of Japanese. Luckily, he had found one enemy soldier sleeping beside a track, and he had seized a boulder and smashed the man's head like a china doll's. Then he took the dead soldier's pistol with which he killed two more of them, shooting one and battering the other with the pistol butt. Now, in the early darkness of September 5th, he lay in the whispering, dripping jungle and wondered if there were more Japanese between him and the marine lines. With daylight, he arose and began walking east again. There was poji bait on Guadalcanal. It would seem absurd that during a time of critical shortages in fuel and goods and ammunition, anyone should bother to bring in candy. And yet, on September 5th, a sky train flown by Lieutenant Colonel Wyman Marshall came in under fire loaded with poji bait and cigarettes. Then Colonel Marshall flew out with a load of wounded. Next day, more sky trains arrived, carrying drums of fuel, ammunition, machine guns and mortar shells departing again with wounded. Thus was begun the famous shuttle operation called SCAT, after South Pacific Combat Air Transportation Command. Meanwhile, the Marines were issued pogey bait at the rate of one bar of candy to a squad. Rather than divide it and provide too little for all, the men drew lots. The blushing winners took their prizes and went slinking into the bush to devour it beyond the reproachful eyes of the losers. Combined fleet had returned to Truk. After ten days of useless cruising north of Guadalcanal, Fifty-odd ships led by Great Yamato sailed into the lagoon to refuel. Admiral Yamamoto called a conference aboard his battleship. He was taciturn as he spoke to his commanders. For the first time, he cautioned against underestimating American fighting strength, and he issued two simple orders. One, keep the location and movements of Japanese carriers unknown to the enemy. Two, make initial air assaults against the enemy as strong as possible. These instructions were to cover combined fleet's support of Major General Kawaguchi's attempt to capture Henderson Field. The all-out aerial assault was to be launched September 12th in concert with Kawaguchi's attack. Commander Tameichi Hara came back from the conference to his destroyer Amatsukaze. Lieutenant Kazue Shimizu, his gunnery officer, met him with a doleful face. What's the matter with you? Hara snapped. We failed to catch a single fish today, Shimizu said. This super fleet of ours has exterminated every fish in the atoll in just three days. On September 9th, the super fleet shoved off again, bound for the Solomons. Lieutenant Amarine had come back from the dead. On September 6th, gaunt and staggering, he wandered into marine lines at Kukum. He was brought to Vandergrift's headquarters to inform intelligence of what he had seen. But Amarine had little to tell. The Japanese he had killed had been stragglers and he had not come upon any large bodies of enemy troops. Colonel Thomas still believed that the large enemy formations were to the east. Clemens's scouts continued to report a Japanese build-up at the village of Tasimboko, about a mile west of Taivu. In fact, Thomas and Colonel Twining had already begun to plan a raid on Tasimboko, and Colonel Edson came to headquarters to propose just such an operation. The night of September 6th, 
Thomas informed Edson that he could go ahead with it. We must not overrate the importance of our successes in the Solomons, the President was saying warningly in his annual Labor Day speech to the nation, though we may be proud of the skill with which these local operations have been conducted. Franklin Roosevelt was preparing America for bad news. Even as Van der Grift's men marched toward their ships to attack Kawaguchi's men at Tasimboko, the president in the White House was minimizing the campaign with the deprecating phrase, local operation. Then, the announcement of Japanese victory on Guadalcanal would not come like the crack of doom. Kiyotake Kawaguchi was as confident of victory as Colonel Ichiki had been. He had 6,200 men ashore, whom he would hurl at Henderson Field in a three-pronged attack. The major blow would be led by himself. He would take a battalion of the 124th Infantry and the two remaining Ichiki battalions to the south of the airfield, wheel and attack north. Another battalion of the 124th would strike west across the Teneru, and from the vicinity of the Matanikau River, two reinforced battalions under Colonel Oka would cross the Lunga River and hit the airfield from the northwest. Meanwhile, the main blow was to be supported by naval gunfire and airstrikes. It was a tidy plan, worthy of any textbook or any army that marches on maps. General Kawaguchi had devised it in the shortlands in between arguments with Admiral Tanaka. It did not occur to him then, as it did not now occur to him, that he might scout the battlefield and the enemy before drawing up a battle plan. Like Colonel Ichiki, he was making free and fiery interpretation of General Hayakutake's measured instructions to view the enemy strength, position and terrain, to see if it was possible or not to achieve quick success with his present strength. An impatient man, Kawaguchi had no intention of wasting time studying the enemy. To him there was no question of quick success. The Americans were few in number and inferior in quality. Japanese spiritual power would triumph. Moreover, by stealing stealthily south, by tunnelling through the jungle, as he called it, he would come up on the American rear and surprise them. The map had shown him a hog-backed ridge which ran down into the airfield. It seemed to be undefended. In such confidence, General Kawaguchi went sloshing southwest. The Ishitari battalion moved off directly westward. Colonel Oka's force, gathering at the Matanikau, marked time for the appointed hour on the night of September 12th. Left behind at Tasimboko were 300 men guarding General Kawaguchi's food, part of his artillery, and a trunk containing his dress whites. After dark on September 7th, the raiders under Colonel Edson boarded two destroyer transports and a pair of converted California tuna launches, now dignified with the initials YP, meaning patrol boat and translated Yippee. The Marines sailed east to Tasimboko, their approach announced by showers of bright red sparks pouring from the Yippies' funnels. In a misty dawn, the raiders clambered into their Higgins boats. The Japanese, aware of their presence, prepared to receive them with a pair of 47mm anti-tank guns capable of blowing the American boats out of the water. But then the shredding mists revealed the large transports Fuller and Bellatrix escorted by a cruiser and four destroyers. They were en route to Lunga Point, but Kawaguchi's rear guard thought they were coming to Tasimboko. The Japanese broke and ran, abandoning the anti-tank guns, their own weapons and their breakfasts. Landing unopposed, the raiders quickly removed the anti-tank guns' breech blocks and hurled them into the sea. Then they struck inland half a mile and wheeled west through a coconut plantation. In the meantime, General Kawaguchi's panicky soldiers had informed the brigade commander that a major enemy landing was being made in his rear, and he, in turn, had notified Rabul. General Hyakutake was at last distressed. He ordered the 41st Infantry Regiment to mark time at Kokoda in New Guinea for possible transfer to Guadalcanal, and then he radioed Tokyo that Kawaguchi was sandwiched. Tokyo quickly notified two battalions in the East Indies to stand by, even as Admiral Mikawa planned a night bombardment with a cruiser and eight destroyers, and the Tokyo Express shipped two battalions of the Aoba detachment aboard. It was a first-class flap which continued to flutter until word came from Kawaguchi, suggesting that his earlier report had been exaggerated. Nevertheless, General Kawaguchi could not turn to strike the raiders. He was bogged down. Among other things, he had underestimated the jungle. His engineers had not been able to hack out the clear straight tunnel that had been promised, 
and 3,000 men of the Kawaguchi Brigade were strung out in a snaking column three miles long. They clawed up slime-slick slopes or stumbled through swamps, sometimes armpit deep, or were tripped at every turn by tangles of root and creeper and fern, ravaged as they went by clouds of stinging wings and all those jungle creatures that fall, fasten and suck. No, Kawaguchi could not turn. He could only send his rear guard the peremptory order, confront the enemy. Plucking up their courage, they did. Two mountain guns and a pair of howitzers and numerous Nambu machine guns began firing from the coconut groves, and Edson's men were pinned down. Edson immediately called for aerial support, and sent a company led by Clemens's scouts along a jungle trail to turn the enemy's right flank. Then Captain Dale Brannan's shark-nosed clunkers arrived to strafe and bomb the Japanese. At noon, the encircling company had deployed in the Japanese rear. Caught in a crossfire, the enemy fled again. Twenty-seven dead bodies were found draped over six heavy machine guns. Most of Kawaguchi's food supply was also discovered, and fifty men were detailed to jab their bayonets into cans of sliced beef and crab meat, while others dragged thousands of bags of rice into the surf. All Japanese weapons were destroyed, and the field pieces towed into the bay. Enemy maps, charts and notebooks were gathered up, and a powerful radio set was wrecked. Then, with great hoarse shouts of joy, the marines blundered into a thatched warehouse loaded with beer and sake. When they returned to their waiting ships late that afternoon, they were loaded down with bottles and with cans of beef and crab, which, as they sheepishly explained to the gently inquiring Colonel Edson, they had somehow forgotten to destroy. It is delicious to drink the enemy's wine and to eat his sweetmeats, and it is glorious to make him grind his teeth, as the raiders did, sailing west to Kukum with Kiyotake Kawaguchi's fancy white duds nailed to the masthead. Mr. Ishimoto had been in the vicinity of Tasimboko, and he reacted swiftly to the American raid. He rounded up the missionaries and demanded again that they advise the Americans to surrender. Father Ud Engberink replied that he could not. As he had said to Martin Clemens, he was neutral. But it would be difficult for Ishimoto to consider white skin and large noses neutral, and he shouted, it is useless to resist the Japanese. They are too strong for you. You cannot win and you must leave Guadalcanal. Again the priests refused. Political affairs were not their concern. Ishimoto ordered them tied and thrown into a native hut where they were tortured and bayoneted to death. Old sister Edmi, her body swollen and deformed by elephantiasis, was sent blundering off into the bush. But sister Sylvia and Odilia, both young, were also murdered after they were raped. The night of his return, Red Mike Edson had gone to Colonel Thomas at Vandergrift's headquarters. This is no motley of Japs, he said in his throaty whisper. Next morning, smiling his cold white smile, Edson was back. Thomas looked up from patrol reports and intelligence interpretations of the captured Tasimboko documents. They're coming, Thomas said. Edson nodded. But from where? He pointed to a ridge on an aerial photograph and whispered, This looks like a good approach. Thomas was startled. Edson had fingered the very ridge to which General Vandergrift, tired of jumping in and out of airfield dugouts, was planning to move his command post. Edson was unperturbed. The ridge was a perfect approach to the airfield. It was a broken hogback running parallel to the Lunga River south of the airfield. South? East and west, that is, front and both sides it was surrounded by jungle, but to the north or rear it ran gently down into Henderson Field. What better approach, Edson argued, and Thomas, agreeing, took him to see the general. Vandergrift was pleased to see the two men unfold their map and confidently pinpoint the avenue of enemy approach. Where is that? he asked. Respectful but reproachful, Edson said, the ridge you insist on putting your new CP behind. Vandergrift smiled softly. He had already rejected some rather profane objections from his staff regarding his new command post, and he was not now going to change his mind. Engineers were already at work building a pavilion which would house the living and working quarters of Vandergrift and his chief of staff, Colonel Capers James. It was to have Japanese wicker furniture and a Japanese icebox run by kerosene and it would be surrounded by woods filled with the colourful parrots and macaws, which Vandergrift found so delightful. No, he would not change his mind, even if he could immediately grasp the danger of leaving that ridge undefended. 
So the general courteously ignored the colonel's respectful rebuke and ordered him to take his composite battalion of 700 raiders and parachutists and block that open ridge. Then the general returned to such urgent matters as his repeated request for reinforcements. He wanted at least one regiment, preferably, if he could get it, his old 7th Marines. The 7th Marines had been in Samoa since the middle of May. Trained as an assault elite, they were withering as garrison troops. There was enchanted moonlight filtering through the branches of banyan trees and the soft plinking of native guitars. There was also a ration of two cans of beer daily and hot food from the galleys. And there was the setse fly that brings mumu, as the Samoans call elephantiasis. None of these things are typical of a corps dedicated to the principle that hunger and hardship are the school of the good soldier. Nothing is too good for you, the Marine Corps tells its men, adding, but we'll let you have it anyway. But on Samoa the Seventh was living it up in comparison to its brother regiments on Guadalcanal, and the spectacle of Colonel James Webb, Gentleman Jim, in his natty whipcord breeches, and his gleaming low-quarter shoes leading hikes in a station wagon was also not calculated to inflame its men with ardour. It was up to the battalion commanders to try to keep their men battle-fit. One of these leaders was Lieutenant Colonel Herman Henry Hanneken, the veteran of the Banana Wars who had killed the Keiko chieftain, King Charlemagne, in personal combat. Another was Major Chesty Puller. At 44, Puller was already a marine legend. He had won two Navy crosses in Haiti and Nicaragua. He was that very rare bird of war, a man who actually loves combat and who is beloved by his men. Puller's Marines delighted in repeating those numerous Pullerisms, true or false, such as his remark when he saw his first flamethrower. Where do you fit the bayonet on it? They boasted of his bullhorn voice and they claimed that his huge chest bulging from an otherwise spindly frame hardly five feet six inches high was capable of repelling enemy bullets. Puller's military credo contained two articles, conditioning and attack. On Samoa, he repeatedly ordered his men out on long hikes beneath a brazen sun, instructing his officers, Gentlemen, remember to have every man carry a one-inch square of beef suet in his pack. If they'll grease their feet daily and avoid so much washing, they'll have no blisters. An old trick from the Haitian soldiers, and it never fails. You can't march men without feet, gentlemen. But Puller, like the other professional officers, soon began to mourn the Samoan confinement. Here I am, stuck out here to rot on this damned island while other people fight the war. They've marooned us. Hearing of the Battle of the Tanaru, he cried, They mowed them down. One of these days we'll be giving them hell like that, better than that. A few weeks later, the 7th Marines were ordered to Espiritu Santo. It was rumoured that they were not going to Guadalcanal, but to New Guinea to fight for General MacArthur. Admiral Gormley pondered a most disturbing message. Admiral Nimitz was ordering Gormley to turn over to General MacArthur one reinforced regiment of experienced amphibious troops, together with the ships required to mount them. Gormley was puzzled. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, who had originated this order, surely must know that the only experienced amphibious troops in the Pacific were fighting for their lives on Guadalcanal. Could he mean the 7th Marine Regiment, even then sailing toward Gormley's area? Gormley asked the advice of Richmond Kelly Turner. He got a very straight answer. The only experienced amphibious troops in the South Pacific are those in Guadalcanal, and it is impracticable to withdraw them. Turner then laid it on the line. I respectfully invite attention to the present insecure position of Guadalcanal. Adequate air and naval strength have not been made available. Vandergrift has consistently urged to be reinforced at once by at least one regiment. I concur. What might have been a very soft filching of Guadalcanal's dwindling strength was thus prevented, and Vandergrift's strength was dwindling. Malaria was now ravaging his ranks as the enemy had not been able to do. Every day, new shortages appeared in bombs, bullets, starter cartridges, oxygen, tyres and lubricating oil, thus complicating old and constant shortages in food and fuel. General Geiger's strength was being whittled by shortages, rather than by zeros. Eight airplanes cracked up on takeoff on September 8th. Two of them were restored to readiness, but the others were hauled off to the boneyard, where sharp-eyed mechanics cannibalised them for spare parts. On September 10th, there were only 11 Wildcats available, and the enemy aerial onslaught was mounting. 
combined fleet sortie from Truk and the steady reinforcement of northern airfields were ominous signs. Admiral Nimitz did not fail to observe them. On that same September 10th, he ordered all carrier aircraft that could be spared to be flown to Guadalcanal, thus contradicting the Navy's doctrine that carrier aircraft should fly from carriers, as well as countermanding Gormley's promise to Fletcher that his fighters would not be committed to Guadalcanal. Pledges made in all sincerity in response to reasonable requests, the niceties of command prerogatives, military dogma, all had to go by the boards now, for the enemy was obviously mounting a major bid to recover Guadalcanal. Crisis had come. General Vandergrift knew it as he moved into his new command post behind the ridge that would be called Bloody, and Red Mike Edson knew it going down to Kukum to tell his men that they were moving to a rest area. Too much bombing and shelling here close to the beach, Edson said. We're moving to a quiet spot. He smiled, enjoying the joke. The men moved out. Twice they were forced to take cover from air raids, but by two o'clock in the afternoon they were fortifying Bloody Ridge. Edson put the parachutists under Harry Torgerson, the singed dynamiter of Gavutu, on his left or eastern flank. The raiders took over the centre and right with the right flank company strung out thinly toward the Lunga. Edson's own command post was in a gully about a hundred yards south of Vandergrift's new headquarters. Here he put his reserve, a depleted company of raiders. None of the men really believed that they had come to a rest area, and some of them were already cursing Edson as a glory hound who hung around headquarters sniffing out bloody assignments for his men. None of them, however, actually suspected that they, and they alone, stood between an approaching enemy and that Henderson Field which was now the prize of the Pacific War. So some of these men did not dig so deeply as they might have, for to dig into coral with truncated entrenching tools, which are little better than trowels, can be so painful and exhausting that only the fear of death can impel some men to attempt it. That fear came upon these marines next morning. Stringing barbed wire and hacking out fields of fire in the undergrowth, they heard the cry, Condition Red. Twenty-six Bettys with twenty escorting zeros were on their way. The men kept on working. The target would be, as always, the airfield behind them. But the target was Bloody Ridge, that tan, humpbacked mound rearing out of the dark green jungle sea like the spine of a whale lapped and shuddered as though harpooned. Those who had dug pits hurled themselves into them, those who had not stood erect or tried to run and were killed or maimed. And then the raid was over. It was quiet on the ridge, beneath the growl and whine of aerial combat in which marine flyers destroyed seven enemy planes, and in which Major Robert Gaylor, shot down in the bay, survived to swim ashore. But the men on Bloody Ridge did not know this. They knew only that the enemy was after their ridge, and they brushed dirt from their dungarees and began to dig with desperate fury. Some goddamn rest area! A corporal snarled. Some goddamn rest area! Out in the jungle, General Kawaguchi's toiling column of 3,000 men took comfort in the sound of Japanese bombs falling on American marines. But it was small comfort. Their march to the battle area had become an excruciating torment. It was a blind, blundering stagger through a malevolent green labyrinth. Kawaguchi had no guides. The policies of Mr. Ishimoto had seen to that, nor did the general have accurate maps or aerial mosaics. Nevertheless, he pressed on. General Hyakutake had insisted that September 12th was to be the night of the attack, and Kawaguchi could not miss that rigid deadline. He closed his eyes to the sight of limping soldiers and took an iron grip on his confidence. He would still prevail. Two of the Ichiki battalions would make the breakthrough, and then the powerful unit led by Lieutenant Colonel Kusukichi Watanabe would dash to the airfield. Kawaguchi's forces to east and west would close in simultaneously, and then the surrender ceremony that day. Remembering his lost white uniform, General Kawaguchi's face darkened and his hand fell to his sabre hilt. Vice Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner also heard those Japanese bombs. He flew in just before Condition Red was sounded, and the Japanese bombers who raked the raiders' ridge also introduced Kelly Turner to the grim realities of life on Guadalcanal. He sat out the raid in Vandergrift's dugout just a hundred yards north of the quaking ridge. He was discomfited, but after the bombers left, Vandergrift noticed that he still looked tense. He was. He pulled a folded sheet of paper from his pocket and silently handed it to Vandergrift. 
Colour drained from the general's face. He winked. He was reading Admiral Gormley's estimate of the situation on Guadalcanal. Commander, South Pacific, summarised the enemy build-up. Naval forces were gathering at Rabaul and Truk. Aerial reinforcements were arriving daily. Dozens of transports were in Simpson Harbour waiting to put troops aboard. An overwhelming push against Guadalcanal was likely. Then Gormley scrutinised his own situation. He listed shortages in cruisers, carriers, destroyer transports and cargo vessels. Admiral Gormley concluded that he could no longer support the Marines on Guadalcanal. Without a word, Vandergrift handed the message to Colonel Thomas. The Colonel read and looked up, dumbfounded. Put that message in your pocket, Vandergrift told him. I'll talk to you about it later, but I don't want anyone to know about it. Thomas nodded, watching Admiral Turner pulling a bottle out of his bag. He poured three drinks and said, Vandergrift, I'm not inclined to take so pessimistic a view of the situation as Gormley does. He doesn't believe I can get the 7th Marine Regiment in here, but I think I have a scheme that will fool the Japs. Turner's plan was simply to bring the 7th over a course well to the east of the normal approach, while carriers Wasp and Hornet and their screens sailed out of sight of the transports as though on normal patrol. Vandergrift was encouraged at the thought of receiving 4,000 fresh troops, but in Turner's next breath he was dismayed. The Admiral was playing general again, because he was still amphibious force commander, and because Guadalcanal had not yet taught the Americans that landing force commanders such as Vandergrift must be at least the equal of the amphibious force commanders, when on the ground Kelly Turner was still Archer Vandergrift's superior. In that capacity, he wanted to use the 7th Marines to carve out little American enclaves on Guadalcanal. He was hopeful of establishing another airfield at Aeola Bay, the point far to the east where Martin Clemens had had his district office. Vandergrift protested. Henderson Field was the prize. It was protected by a perimeter. All troops should be used to hold that perimeter until it was time to go on the offensive to drive Japan from the island. The two men could not agree, and their discussion of how to use the 7th Marines ended in stalemate. That afternoon, reinforcements of a different order arrived. 24 Wildcats from crippled Saratoga flew into Henderson Field, led by Commander Leroy Simpler. That night, the Tokyo Express was on schedule. For almost two hours, Japanese naval shells combed Bloody Ridge. Once again, the coral shivered and shook, and Edson's men dug their noses into damp coral and prayed. Once again, Kelly Turner took shelter in Vandergrift's dugout. He heard the shells whispering hoarsely overhead, heard them crash and felt their shock waves rattle the dugout. He had time to reflect on his earlier criticism of Vandergrift as being unduly concerned for the safety of his perimeter. In the morning, Vandergrift showed him the carnage, especially the field hospital struck by a big shell. Before Turner departed, he told Vandergrift, when I bring the seventh in, I will land them where you want. Aboard Saratoga in Pearl Harbor that afternoon, Admiral Chester Nimitz was about to present decorations. All hands were lined up on the flight deck. Nimitz stepped to the microphone and said, Boys, I've got a surprise for you. Bill Halsey's back. A storm of applause greeted Admiral Halsey as he stepped on deck, and the light blue eyes beneath the bristling grey eyebrows filled with tears. Halsey was ready for his new assignment, command of a carrier task force built around Enterprise, but his ships were not ready yet. In the meantime, he would tour the South Pacific on an itinerary that would take him, he hoped, to Guadalcanal. General Vandergrift had seen Admiral Turner safely off. Now he was walking back to his command post with Colonel Thomas. Vandergrift was preoccupied, thinking of Gormley's gloomy estimate. Then his jaw lifted and he said, You know, Jerry, when we landed in Tientsin in 1927, old Colonel E.B. Miller ordered me to draw up three plans. Two concerned the accomplishment of our mission, the third a withdrawal from Tientsin in case we got pushed out. Vandergrift's words came soft and slow. Jerry, we're going to defend this airfield until we no longer can. If that happens, we'll take what's left to the hills and fight guerrilla warfare. I want you to go see Bill Twining, swear him to secrecy and have him draw up a plan. Thomas went to see Twining. We can't let this be another baton, Bill. We'll go to the headquarters of the Lunga. We'll take our food and bullets. Twining agreed. He went to his tent and wrote out by hand an operation order which had neither date nor serial number. He put it in his safe. 
Over at the pagoda, Archer Vandergrift spoke to Roy Geiger. He told him that the Marines were staying on Guadalcanal, Navy or no Navy. But if the time comes when we no longer can hold the perimeter, I expect you to fly out your planes. Geiger said, If we can't use the planes back in the hills, we'll fly them out. But whatever happens, I'm staying with you. Vandergrift nodded appreciatively. And then the siren wailed and the cry arose, Condition red! Forty-two enemy airplanes were winging down from the north. To meet them, Cactus Air Force sent 11 Marine and 21 Navy fighters thundering skyward. Sixteen enemy planes were knocked down at a loss of one American ensign killed in a dead stick landing. But some of the bombers got through. Once more, Marines on the ridge dove without hesitation into their holes. Again, sticks of 500-pound bombs and strings of daisy-cutter fragmentation bombs walked the ridge, killing, maiming, stunning. Now the men of Red Mike Edson drove themselves to complete their fortifications. Spools of wire stripped from less threatened positions were brought up and hastily strung. Extra grenades and belted machine gun ammunition were put into the pits. To the rear, batteries of 105mm howitzers had been moved to new positions to give Edson close support. Artillery fire plans had been drawn and maps gridded. An artillery observer was stationed in Edson's command post on the southern snout. Communication wire ran backward to a fire direction centre and Vandergrift's headquarters. The General's Slender Reserve, the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, moved into supporting positions. Its officers scouted approach routes which they might have to follow in darkness. Every gun, every Marine on Guadalcanal was now committed. It was now up to the raiders on the ridge. The enemy was coming that night, Vandergrift was certain. Clemens's scouts had come in with reports of 3,000 men moving toward assembly points on the Lunga's east bank. Darkness came quickly as it does in the tropics. In swiftly dying sunlight, homing birds lost the brilliance of their plumage. Above the ridge, the skies were clouding over. Soon that long, knobby peninsula was blending into the black of the jungle flowing around it. It was silent. The last spade had clinked on coral. The last command had been shouted. Marines in their holes closed and reopened their eyes to accustom them to darkness. They listened for the regular sounds of men among the irregular sounds of nature. Sometimes their mouths twitched to hear an iguana bark or the carack of the bird, whose cry was like the clapping of wooden blocks. It began to rain. General Kawaguchi's iron confidence was rusting in the rainforest. The jungle had scattered his detachments. He was not ready to attack, and yet he must. Rabaul was counting on it. He would like another day to prepare, but he could not ask for it even if he had dared, because the Americans had destroyed his radio at Tassimboko. Helpless, he put his available forces along the Lunga opposite the Marine right flank and awaited the naval bombardment that was to precede his attack. Louis the Laos droned overhead. Around nine o'clock he dropped a flare. A half hour later a cruiser and three destroyers shelled the ridge. Some of their projectiles crashed around the Marine positions. Some fell short, but most of them exploded harmlessly in jungle west of the Lunga. Edson's men tightened their grip on their weapons. The shelling ceased twenty minutes after it began. A rocket rose from the jungle. Machine gun and rifle fire broke out like a sputtering string of firecrackers, and the Kawaguchis came pouring out of the black. Banzai! they screamed. Marine, you die! they shrieked. They drove the raiders back. They sliced off a platoon on the far right flank, cut communications wire and went slipping farther down the Lunga to attempt an encirclement. On the left, the Japanese struck the parachutists half a dozen times, punched holes in their front and broke them up. And then they milled wildly about, unable to capitalise on the impetus of their blows, and before dawn, Edson was able to pull back his left flank and reform it. But General Kawaguchi had no such control. His troops battled beyond his reach. Their attacks became purposeless and fragmented, on the right, where they had gained the greatest success, they lost their way once they had departed the straight going of the riverbank. They thrashed and fell in the underbrush. Their jabbing bayonets met empty air or dug up earth. Meanwhile, marine mortars flashed among them, and marine artillery whistled down into pre-plotted areas, and found Japanese flesh there as anticipated. Gradually, the American platoon that had been cut off fought its way back to the right slope of the ridge. At dawn, the Japanese melted back into the jungle. The Marines rose up and counter-attacked to regain lost ground. 
bloody ridge had held. That morning, Red Mike Edson called a conference of staff officers and company commanders. They sat around him in a semicircle, drinking coffee and smoking. Red Mike sat on a log, his legs crossed, spooning cold hash from an open can. He chewed slowly as he talked. They were testing, he said. Just testing. They'll be back. But maybe not as many of them. He smiled. Or maybe more. He paused, his jaws chewing. I want all positions improved, all wire lines paralleled, a hot meal for the men. Today, dig, wire up tight, get some sleep. We'll all need it. His officers rose. The nip will be back, Red Mike said. I want to surprise him. Major Kenneth Bailey was among the officers who set to work preparing Edson's surprise, a pullback from the previous night's positions. Bailey had been wounded at Tulagi and sent to a hospital in New Caledonia. Leaving without permission, and before his wound was fully healed, he had hitchhiked an airplane ride back to Guadalcanal in time for the battle. Edson's pullback served to tighten and contract his lines. It improved the field of fire for automatic weapons, and it confronted the Japanese with a hundred yards of open ground over which they must move to close with the Marines. Many of those Marines had the look of sleepwalkers by afternoon of this September 13th. They stumbled along the ridge, lifting their feet high like men in chains. Seventy-two near-sleepless hours, hours of shock and sweat and pain beneath the enemy's bombs and shells, in the face of his bullets had numbed them. They had expected to be relieved by Vandergrift's reserve, but intermittent aerial attacks had kept that battalion under cover. Three separate air raids struck at Henderson Field that day, but there were now ample fighters on hand to meet them. Wildcats had come in from carriers Hornet and Wasp and Guadalcanal, received its first torpedo bombers with the arrival of six Avengers.